Hello, my name is Rosalind Love and I'm from the Department of Anglo-Saxon, Norse and Celtic, known as ASNAC for short. And I'd like to introduce you to one of my colleagues, Dr Ali Bonner. Hi Ali, could you tell us which part of the ASNAC course you're responsible for? Yeah, hello Ros. Um, I'm responsible for the history of the Britonic speaking peoples and the history of the Gaelic speaking peoples. And I suppose the first thing that most uh, potential applicants ask, what, are the, what does that mean exactly? So if we start with the history of the Gaelic speaking peoples, it's the people who spoke the Irish language, but that doesn't mean it's restricted to Ireland. So we cover the history of Ireland, absolutely. And generally speaking, both of the courses, the strands I teach, go from about 380 to about 1170. So that's picking up just before the end of the Roman Empire, before it disintegrates in the West. And in Ireland, we start with uh, that Roman period and the level of potential influence of the Roman Empire, which was just next door in Britain on Ireland, and then the arrival of Christianity and the missions to Ireland. And what that does is it brings writing to Ireland. And one of the most amazing characteristics of our early medieval Irish history is the number of texts that survive from that period, fascinating and absolutely brilliant texts. So we have early saints' lives, we have early writing in vernacular in the old Irish language. So we tell the story of uh, the political, social and economic history of Ireland. Of course, a major part of that is the arrival of the Vikings and the creation of this new phenomenon, the Hiberno-Norse, this, this hybrid uh, identity of both Irish and Scandinavian Viking uh, background. So that's Vikings who can speak the Irish language. Mm -hmm. So Ireland changes fantastic that time and then it, there's an, a major intellectual development and also a diaspora of Irish scholars moving to the continent and that's often why texts from Ireland have survived is because scholars took them to the continent. So we study the effects of the Vikings on Ireland and then later on we get we, we finish with the arrival of the Anglo-Normans in Ireland but of course as I said Gaelic speakers were not confined to Ireland there is a diaspora but particularly they are on the west coast of what we now call Scotland so actually part of the history of the Gaelic speaking peoples is the development the creation the early medieval history of what we now call Scotland and how they were on the west coast in a kingdom that was known as Dalriada and then they move eastwards as at the same time as possibly because of the arrival of the Vikings and they in fact merge with or possibly take over that's a question of historical interpretation the Picts and what comes out of that process is the modern day Scotland so there are fantastic texts the, 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 the real greatest thing about this course really why you'd want to study is the fantastic text so we start with Patrick's original writings there are lots of wonderful saints lives particularly the life of Columba so Columba's an Irishman, but he goes to Dalriada and he sets up a, an amazing uh, foundation of, of, church, of monasteries. Um, so it's great texts and uh, it covers a, a great deal of history, but it's not just confined to Ireland. It's, it's the Irish, Irish speakers, both in Scotland and then also we do talk about them in the continent. Also, talk now about the history of the Britonic speaking peoples, because again, you might wonder, what does that cover? It cover, we do cover lowland Britain, so we cover all of Britain, um, lowland Britain in the post-Roman period before it becomes really an Anglo-Saxon kingdom. But then there are four main areas, so we look at Wales and the southwest of Britain, the southwest peninsula. We look at the Picts, because the Picts are north of Hadrian's Wall in, in what we in modern day Scotland, but they speak a Britonic language, so they qualify as Britonic speakers, so we look at their history. Uh, both their emergence and through the whole of the early medieval period, their development, they become an extremely dynamic cultural uh, community. And we look at whether they can be described as a community and then the impact of the Vikings on them and eventually their merger or their takeover by the Gaelic speakers who were in the west of modern day Scotland. Mm -hmm. So we've got the southwestern Wales, we've got the Picts, we also look at the North Britons not much survives in the, well there is no independent kingdom of the north britons but we look at what happened to the britonic speakers in what became anglo-saxon northumbria and we also look at um, Brittany. so the britons who moved to the northwest peninsula of france what's now called Brittany, um, and caused that triggered that change of name from armorica to Brittany. 
So that's what Britonic history covers. Unlike Gaelic history, there are just the most sensational texts. So there's a text by someone called Gildas called On the Ruin of Britain. We also have great saint's lives. There's a, a, a potentially early saint's life, the life of Samson of Dole. And he starts out in South Wales. He then moves through the Southwest Peninsula. So what we'd now call Devon, Devon and Cornwall. And then he goes to Brittany. So he really shows that the diaspora of the Britonic speakers um, and where they were active um, in this period. But also Britonic history covers the movement of the Irish into the west of Britain. So that's another factor, a way in which Gaelic history and Britonic history are combined. If I was going to say, why would anyone want to study these subjects? Mm -hmm. I would guess it's because it is an intellectual challenge and an intellectual training. Because we, in the Department of Anglo-Saxon, North and Celtic, we look at, we study them from three different levels. First of all, primary evidence. Then uh, what historians have written, so the historiography and the influences on historians, the models they've set up and why they have chosen to prioritise certain evidence and perhaps downplay or even not, not give any weight to some types of evidence. And thirdly, we then look at disciplines because it is a multidisciplinary, it's a cross-disciplinary uh, subject. So we look at archaeological reports, we also um, look at textual, as historians, we look at uh, textual um, analysis, and we have to weigh up the different ways that different disciplines work. So uh, archaeology would be a constructive process from material remains, they construct a narrative, whereas his historians tend to have perhaps or can have quite a, a destructive process where they will look at a text and say, actually there's nothing we can take from this at all. So historians are not obliged to create a narrative. They can simply say this text tells us nothing. So in that way we're actually operating on three levels of analysis and, and students will learn to juggle those three different levels of analysis and make their own assessments of the primary evidence in order to create their own narrative and to make a case and, to, and each week to, to present that case. So it's both got fascinating material, but it's also a very sound and, and challenging intellectual training. Yeah, I've got a very deep question I want to ask you in a minute, but can I just ask a slightly shallower question? What is the most mysterious piece of evidence that students have to look at for your, your periods? I Oh gosh, that's a really good question. I guess the, one of the things that's really important for, for Britonic history and Gaelic history is inscriptions. So stone inscriptions, stone uh, letter, wording, name, mm. inscriptions on monuments. And it's how you interpret that and, and yeah. what you take from it, what it means. It raises so many fascinating possibilities because you have personal names and group names that are redolent of particular, they might be an Irish name, you have actual script Ogham script is an Irish script. It's only ever used for writing Irish language. So um, if it's present, that, that tells you it's, it's, it's absolute proof that there were Irish and usually elite Irish speakers because it's expensive to put up a monument and to have an inscription put on it. Um, but there are, for example, there are inscriptions in what's now lowland Scotland, so between Hadrian's Wall and Antonet, so north of, just north of the border into modern Scotland. There are Latin inscriptions with Latin names that look very Latinate, and some of them look very Christian in culture. And it is, um, because it was north of Hadrian's Wall and not part of the Roman Empire, they raise huge possibilities about why are people self-identifying with a Latin written culture in the post-Roman period when they weren't before, when the Roman Empire was there. So they start to identify, and this happens in the southwest of Britain as well, people yeah. start to put up monuments that clearly are advertising, I come from a Roman culture, in an area that wasn't particularly Romanized when the Roman Empire was actually <laughs> present. Yeah. So, and I would also say things like the Pictish symbol stone, those are very right, mysterious. Yes. So whether they bespeak one unified Pictish culture, which they appear to do, but then the political evidence suggests that actually this is very much a uh, different region. There is no one Pictish kingdom. That's, again, the Pictish symbol stones and the outliers, where they spread to and the, the nature of the, uh, the political relations. I guess, I guess it's the inscriptions, really, Rose, if I had to pick one thing. Yeah, yeah. So now for the deep question. Why is it important to study medieval history in the 21st century, do you think? 
I suppose that the first question is that it it's a fantastic discipline, fantastic, fantastic training. It really is one of the most tricky. But secondly, it deals with questions of identity and where we come from. And if you want to get to the root of the question of what identity is founded on, actually early medieval history is the place to go. It is the field to study. Because what, what you see is really how this rhetoric is used, why people are doing it, and the discrepancy, the gulf between the rhetoric that elites are putting out. And you, you have to, you know, most of the texts that survive are put out by elites, whether that's it is religious elites or whether it's uh, simply uh, finance, you know, in terms of landed wealth elites. Mm -hmm. But it's normally those people, not always, there might be outlier individuals, one monk maybe somewhere who's expressing his own opinion. But usually what you're looking at is the difference between the rhetoric and the reality of the elite behaviour, because they'll often put out a rhetoric of identity very strongly actually but their behavior in terms of um, we can track their behavior in terms of particularly marriage alliances and uh, so they will put up monuments and inscriptions that advertise a particular identity but that's very different from their actual behavior which shows uh, so i i think it's, it's a if you want to understand how identity works how ethnic identity or any sort of identity works mm -hmm. the early medieval period is the period when there are, are all these different identities that are jostling and you can see what they're doing, how it works, why elites use identity in any kind of a rhetorical strategy. Fantastic. I'm just gonna throw in a kind of bonus question, which is slightly to the side of, of, of the subject area, Ali. Um, you joined ASNAC as a, as a mature student. Um, could you just say just a tiny bit about your experience of, of coming back to study as a mature student? Because that, I mean, that's, that's been a really important element of, of the student body that we've had in ASNAC. I think, that's, I think that's it. When you say it's been an important part of it, it ASNAC was so welcoming to mature students. I was, I was not the only mature student there at the time. I think there is always at least one and usually a couple. And for me, it was an, just the welcomingness, the fact that I was I, I was just an ordinary student like everyone else, and uh, it was just a great place to come. It, there was no uh, difference. It was a very rich, it, I, just, I guess because ASNAC students are so engaged in the subject, so it doesn't matter how old, what age you are, and in fact, everyone is just really interested in the subject, and the staff are so welcoming. So it's a real intellectual and, and scholarly community who are just passionate. It's the community that's passionate about the subject that is, is what's really noticeable about ASNAC. So it was a wonderful experience. The, the, the primary characteristic of it was just a great experience to come as a mature student to ASNAC. Great. Thank you so much, Ali. Thank you very much.